So thank you and good morning, everyone. Uh, right away, I do want to acknowledge that Creative Mornings and the Victoria Arts Council uh, do their work and is and introducing you to this, um, this lively discussion on the traditional territory of the Kwangan speaking people, which is also now known as the Songhees and uh, Wasanich First Nations. Uh, it's been a very heavy week um, of speaking truth to power. And uh, I think a lot of our hearts are heavy and I'm, uh, I'm reminded of how important it is uh, that we say the Kwangan speaking people. And we, this land is del delineated through language and communication. And so with that in an open heart, we uh, are extremely honored to uh, do the work we're doing here and this conversation as part of the international network of Creative Mornings and on the theme of matriarchy for June, 2021. So how important is that? Um, my name is Kagan McFadden. I'm the executive director of the Victoria Arts Council and part of the team uh, that leads Creative Mornings here in Victoria. I'd like to thank the city of Victoria for some sponsorship funding as well as HCMA Architects. Um, also, uh, the, as maybe some of you had heard us uh, sort of preamble, uh, Andrea Walker Collins was very instrumental in introducing uh, Creative Mornings to Victoria along with another team of volunteers uh, so we thank Andrea and uh, the other uh, people involved in bringing this uh, very uh, lively and important discussion platform to our city and to our region. And uh, we hope to uh, do the similar good work that they had done previously uh, going forward. This will be a monthly lecture series if you're not already attuned to that uh, with different guests uh, invited to speak on various topics. So, uh, and now I'd like to introduce Leah McInnes. Leah is the Outreach Coordinator for the Victoria Arts Council, as well as the team lead, along with myself, uh, for the Creative Mornings. Uh, Leah joined the, Creative, uh, the Arts Council in 2019, and we've been so excited to have her and work with her. Uh, and uh, she troubleshoots a lot of stuff. <laughs> so thank you, Leah. And uh, that's all I have to say right now. Thanks, Fabian. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, this morning. So I have a little uh, slideshow um, for Creative Mornings to thank our funders, our sponsors. And then I'm going to introduce Lisa and then uh, Lisa will take it away. So I'm just going to go into screen share. Okay. Uh, so Oops. Welcome to Creative Mornings. Kagan gave uh, a bit of a uh, synopsis of it. It's a really, really interesting uh, global network of creative thinkers, artists, designers, um, architects, writers. So we're we're very um, we're very happy to be leading the Victoria chapter of Creative Mornings. Um, June's theme is matriarchy. Uh, this month, we shine a light on all the leaders who are also women from across the vast spectrum of identities and experiences of womanhood. The decision makers, the life givers, the caregivers, the frontline workers, the problem solvers, the world changers, the organizers and activists, the artists and writers and innovators, the teachers, scientists, medical professionals, politicians, business owners, the ones with megaphones and the ones working behind the scenes, because without you, where would our world be? Uh, we want to, oh, uh, so this theme of matriarchy was chosen by the Rotterdam chapter of Creative Mornings. And this illustration uh, was designed by Xavier Altina. We want to say thank you to MailChimp, Creative Mornings official global partner for marketing. And like Creative Mornings, MailChimp deeply values community. They have a special insider community for freelancers and agencies that help small businesses succeed. And it's called MailChimp and Co. It's designed to help you grow your business, expand your expertise and get insider MailChimp perks. And it's free. <laughs> we really recommend you take a look. It's, uh, you can find it at MailChimp.com slash and co. We also want to thank Skillshare, our global partner for online learning. Skillshare is an online learning community helping millions take the next step for their creative journey. 
And we love the overlaps that exist between our two communities, Creative Mornings and Skillshare. This month, the Creative Mornings team is checking out the Adobe Photoshop Essentials training course with Daniel Scott and also creating your dream career with former Creative Morning speaker, Holly M. Coley Murchison. Okay, so now that I've gotten the ad reads out of the way, um, <laughs> we want to thank today's speaker, Lisa Canoris. So Lisa Canoris is a former student at the University of Victoria, where she majored in Indigenous Studies and minored in Political Science. Lisa is from the Sewetmuk, uh, which means people of the spread out lands. She grew up on Splatson's traditional territory in Enderby, BC, and then moved to Victoria to learn about her Wasanic traditional ways. Lisa self-identifies through the Wasatmuk and Wasanic and the continued engagement with family, community, and a relationship to land resurgence, uh, a relationship, relation to land resurgence and governance. She finds strength in reclaiming self-determination through revitalizing culture and language practices. Her responsibilities are dedicated to grassroots and social justice movements for Indigenous communities. Lisa is the founder of the recent launch of Matriarch Resistance, inspired to create safe spaces for Indigenous women and femme communities, while bringing awareness to violence against women and the missing, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and Two-Spirit. Matriarch Resistance endeavors to empower Indigenous women and femmes through self-awareness, self-identity, and self-empowerment. So please welcome Lisa Knorris. Lisa Kanoris. Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Kanoris, and I come from the Sequat Magulu. I just want to make a land acknowledgement in which the lands I am on today, it is the Huistanich traditional territories of my ancestral roots. I have recently connected with my family here um, in the Huistanich territories as in the last two years. I transferred here to go to uh, UVic to major in Indigenous studies and minor in political science. And so what I want to start off today is that I'm not sitting here alone. I, I called in my ancestors to sit with me. I said a prayer and I have a feather and I have a scar from all of the ceremonies that I've been a part of. I'm never alone. My ancestors and my previous matriarchs are sitting with me today. And so I want to take that moment to acknowledge the work that has been done before me and the work that will be done after me. As of the last, as, as of the last maybe four to five years, I've been reclaiming my self-identity the Sahuati within itself and within the movement with Indigenous communities and especially with Indigenous women and femmes, I find strength in reclaiming culture, the language, and who we are as Indigenous people. And I want to share a little bit about myself. Growing up, I grew up in, in Splatson. Splatson is my home. That is my mom's um, territory and community. That's where my matriarchs were were raised and also where we come from. But I recently just learned also that um, my great grandmother, Rosila, she's my dupe, but she's my ancestor now. And she and she was raised in Glen Eden. Glen Eden is right beside Splatson. And so as I learn about my history, I'm learning about my matriarchs who are in my life. And they give me strength in this colonial world, in these colonial institutions. And within my research, um, I find a lot of my knowledge through sitting down with elders, um, uh, some of it through archives. I spent hours on end looking through archives, looking at photos, um, going around and introducing myself and who I am. And even within that alone, um, I am so humbled by the knowledge that has been passed down to me. And again, as of recently, I have found strength in reclaiming who I am as a matriarch and being able to hold up other Indigenous women and femmes that are wanting to reclaim who they are because it has, it is our inherent right 
and it is who we are as Indigenous women and femmes to stand together collectively, upholding each other's voices as, um, sorry. <laughs> and so even within that alone, like Indigenous women and femmes, we face colonial violence on a daily basis. And so even within that, I have witnessed that within my own life and myself personally. And that magazine that I published with Until Magazine that was a part of the Legacy Art Gallery, I shared a vulnerable part of my story in the colonial violence against Indigenous women. And not only do Indigenous women face um, the gendered violence, but it's the it's because we are Indigenous women. So it's the race and the gender that are oppressed against our existence. And so even within that, like as I am on my fourth year, I'll be graduating next year. And so a lot of my research has been dedicated towards um, toward my Sukhwetmik identity, but also within politics and how Indigenous women and femmes have been oppressed within these political systems, constitutional laws, and how we've been marginalized. And so even within that alone, that is not who we are. This struggle and the marginalization and the genocide and, this, and the assimilation is not our self-identity. And I want everyone to know that today is when people say Indigenous, they think of residential schools, they think of MMIW, but that, that, but that is not only who we are, that is not our self-identity. And we are the resistance, we are, we are our ancestors' children, we are the land and the land is us. And so to really uphold who we are as Indigenous women needs to be recognized and that we all come from different ancestors, you know, all across Turtle Island, all across nation to nation, we have our own ways of governance. We have our own languages and how we relate because our self-identity is through the land and through our families and through our communities. And so within the last years, I have, I. I have been four years of sobriety. I've been walking the road of really reclaiming my spirit back as it has been taken away from my family through the assimilation process through my matriarchs and also through my father. My father is um, a survivor of Kamloops Residential School. And so I've learned to reclaim my matriarch through that and even that is a struggle within itself and so really being able to reclaim my position and not only for myself but the women in my family and for my mother and for my grandmother and it's it's been the last five years that I've been able to actually have and have conversation with my matriarchs you know and even within that too, there's a lot of vulnerability, you know, is like being the matriarch to be able to be wise, but be spoken, you know? And so even um, with that being said, like um, I uphold my grandmother so much. She's my rock, she's my angel. And she's so humble. She's like, no, like all of it's within you. Like you are, like you are strong. I'm like, but it comes from you. Like, you know, like growing up, I remember always going to my grandma's house and she would be making baby boards. She would be making birch baskets. Like I remember being so young and she was skinning deer and she was like, I remember sitting with her in the garden when I was so little and I'm getting a little emotional because I'm very proud of where I come from and even just talking about the matrix in my life. Um, that's where my strength is. That's where my backbone comes from. And so, um, you know, even with my mother, even with my mother, like, I feel like I have learned so much from her, her and her stories, you know, and because of colonization, we did grow up very Christian. And so as time went on, um, I'm very proud to, to, walk the road that I am. I feel like my ancestors and the matriarchs and Kalkukbi, that's creator, they have touched my heart and my spirit. And I've went to ceremonies. Um, uh, I, 
I am a part of like the grassroots. I stand in solidarity with other matriarchs and other indigenous communities. And I do a lot of work with youth and also the co-founder of Matriarch Resistance as of recently. And even within that alone, like everything I do is collective. It's never just for myself. It's to be able to see other women rise. It's to be able to see our communities come together. And that's part of decolonization is to uphold our matriarchs as they have been marginalized. They, as indigenous women, we have numbers over our head right now. We are falling through the cracks faster than anyone can even count. And that was, that's a big part of why I walk the red road and I do the work that I do is because I could have been one of those numbers. I could have been one of those, those statistics as I have faced sexual violence at the young age of four. I was in a, rare, a really abusive relationship by, by 16. You know, and so going through all of that and witnessing the effects of intergenerational trauma from my father, you know, and not having that protection, not having that full family, you know, and watching my mother struggle as an Indigenous woman, making it through these institutions and struggling from racism, you know, and poverty and being marginalized because you're Indigenous, but then also understanding that we have strength in who we are as Indigenous women. And that's why I hold up matriarchs so much within my heart is because we are going missing. There's violence against Indigenous women every single day. And, but also I wanna, uh, I also wanna acknowledge the uprise as well. I want to uphold the collective resistance the collective healing and the collective voices coming together as of recently. And I'm just so grateful to be able to share this space, to be able to share my story. And also I wanna, I wanna touch on matriarch resistance. Um, again, I, I ended up collaborating with Ivy Richardson and the idea for matriarch resistance is to uphold Indigenous women and femmes collectively through self-empowerment, through connection and sisterhood. And even within that alone, it's been such an amazing process. I'm so grateful to be able to stand here today and to know that I want to leave a legacy behind, not even just with myself, but collectively collectively together, upholding who we are as Indigenous women and femmes, and knowing that we, that we aren't just a number, we aren't just a statistic, but every one of us matter, and our voices collectively will make a difference. And through the process of developing matriarch resistance, I gained a sister, I gained a best friend, <laughs> And even within that too, like, I am just so, I'm so empowered to listen to other Indigenous women and femmes and the gifts that they have to bring, you know, because as, as we see today, there are Indigenous women on platforms, but I want to hear the Indigenous women at the back of the room. I want to hear their story. I want to hear, I want to hear their matriarch and their life. I want to hear the voices that aren't being spoken about and how important that is that we all deserve to have a voice. We all deserve to sit in a circle to be upheld with each other and to dismantle colonization, to overcome this simulation and be proud of who we are as Indigenous women. You know, I want to live in a world where my Indigenous sisters are not missing, but they're here with me today. I want to live in a world where Indigenous women and femmes can make it to the land before they go missing. I want to see my sisters to be able to hold their medicine, not, at all, not only for themselves, but for their families and our communities. And I just envision this world that I probably won't see in this lifetime. I won't see the end, but just being a part of the revolution and being a part of the transition, 
makes me feel honored and humbled that creator has came into my life and has touched my spirit. And I have called my ancestors and my matriarchs into my life. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And so I just want to share a story that has really, um, it's taught me to love who I am as an Indigenous woman. I'm holding this feather here today. And when I first started, when I first started my sobriety, I really struggled. I really, really struggled after my, after my abusive relationship. Um, and so within that, I was, I was really lost. And so I ended up meeting this traditional man and he taught me things that I felt honored being an Indigenous woman, you know, going to ceremony, being able to connect with someone on a spiritual level. And one night um, I was gifted this feather for being honored as a woman, for holding strength, for walking the road that I do. And so I carry this feather with me because I've never been gifted. I've never had anybody honor me just for being an Indigenous woman, not just an Indigenous woman, but being a Sequetnik woman and honoring me for the road that I was on. And even in that darkest time and like where I was at, like to see the light in me when I didn't even see the light in myself. And so ever since then, like I've just really been able to connect to culture and really see the light in myself, even in the darkest times. And so that's the work that I wanna continue doing, I hope. And I pray to see matriarch resistance in the program that we are building up to uprise. I wanna see all indigenous women and femmes to be able to stand in their power, to use their voice, to be able to be heard for what is needed. As our communities, we are healing, but we are hurting. And to be able to live a life where we are thriving rather than surviving. And even within that too, like, even going to ceremony and listening to elders and listening to my grandmother speak is, is so beautiful and it has healed parts of me that I'm still learning to understand. There's so many parts and stories that I haven't even heard about myself because of the blood memory. You know, blood memory is part of my matriarchal blood. And that's where I feel like, even with my mother, like my mom is just like, she's like, I don't even know because she, like, she's very, very Christian. And my, my father, he's not cultural. And so I've learned to reclaim who I am by being patient, by reaching out. And I do believe in blood memory I believe in the connection that I have with my ancestors in the land. And again, um, going back to Splatson, I learned to swim in that river. It's the river that molded me into the woman that you see today. That river nourished me. And my, my mom used to share stories with me about my Duba. I always go back to her. She's my rock. And I don't remember her, but I always, I always feel her with me. And she didn't speak English at all. She only spoke Sequatmixtine. And I always hear by the end of her life that she was blind. And so when I close my eyes, I can feel her with me at all times. And I pray to her. And my mom used to tell me stories on how she would go down to the river and she would bathe herself and she would do ceremony. And because of colonization, a lot of people in my community and even in my family, they don't practice ceremony. So it was through the stories I learned to reclaim and I would be by myself. I would be alone 
and it was just their stories and I would pray to creator and I'm like I don't know what I'm doing here but I know that I'm here for a reason and there's stories about this river there's stories about the healing that comes through that blood memory that I can feel it when I'm here when I'm doing ceremony on my own and I'm bathing and I'm connecting not only with the land but with the water you know and upholding my right and who I am as an Sequatmic woman and so reclaiming who I am and knowing that one day that I will be sitting in my grandmother's seat like she's our matriarch in our family and on my hardest days I think of her I think of my grandmother and she went to residential school too and she always tells me you know, how, how proud she is of me and our connection together as grandmother and granddaughter and breaking the intergenerational trauma that has broken up the matriarchs in my bloodline. And it's not easy work, but it's worth it. And even within that alone too, like before my grandmother went to residential school, she didn't speak any English and that's my mom's mom she didn't know any English all she knew was Sequat McSheen with her 16 siblings and my great-grandmother Rosila used to braid her hair all the 16 kids every day and every year they got a new pair of moccasins and I'm like to me that's rich that's so rich and so that's only a part of the story that my grandmother has allowed me to share. And we are in the process of documenting her story before residential school and after. And that's my connection with her and being able to grow strong, to be able to, to break these barriers that have broken the women up in my family and to be able to stand strong in solidarity and knowing that we are one. Like when I see my mother and my grandma, when, when I see my mother and my grandmother in the same room, I see myself. And that's a part of being a matriarch that makes me proud. It makes me so honored and humbled to have my grandmother and to have my mother and to be able to come together in prayer to be able to come together in a way that makes sense to us and that we're still learning and that's something that my grandmother always tells me too like we can sit and talk for hours and hours and just ever since I was that little girl I remember her telling me stories and I remember just being I always felt like I had an old soul and I, it's just, it's parts of these stories within my family that I'm still learning and the work that's being done. And even coming here today, I was making slideshows and I was looking at different things and I'm like, I'm just gonna speak from my heart. I'm just gonna speak from a place and just invite my ancestors to sit with me and pray, to live every day in prayer, to live every single day, not only just for myself, but for the ones that are connected to me and being able to thrive and being able to save my energy for when I am called to the front lines when I am called, like, for example, when I went home and I ran home for my dad, he's a, he's a residential school survivor and I've never ran so hard. I've never cried so much. And it was for him. I ran home for him. And that's part of the matriarch and who I am and the work that I'm doing. And it's, again, it's not easy work, but it's worth it to show my dad love, to show him, because that's what it takes to be the matriarch in my family, is I wanna show my father, I wanna show my parents and my grandparents that all of the work that was done before me 
it matters and that I'm just so humbled and I'm so honored to sit here and to be able to share parts of my story and how I relate to matriarch and the work again that's being done out on the land like I look at you know what was being done in Huesoatan, tiny house warriors you know and then also the old growth blockade there's matriarchs on the front line as we speak right now because of their connection to their culture the to the vision that they see moving forward and that's decolonization decolonization is being able to stand in your power and your leadership i've seen matriarchs give up everything to go back to their community and back to the land. And that's that's where I wanna be one day. I wanna be on the land. I wanna live true grassroots and be surrounded around other matriarchs. So one day when I have a daughter of my own, I wanna be like, it wasn't just me. All of this work was from the other women, from all the other indigenous women and femmes doing this work collectively. And that's the world that I envision. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful for everyone sitting here listening today. And a part of me feels like I'm rambling, but I'm just speaking from my heart, like as if I was sitting at a table with an auntie or a grandma or my, you know, and so, and I think that's, I think that's really important when we start talking about decolonization is you know, like I've been learning to live a life where, yeah, we have work, we have school, we have these responsibilities, but really what does it mean to decolonize? You know, and like, what does it really mean to reclaim indigenous sovereignty and indigenous um, self-determination? And so, yeah, I don't know, was that 20 minutes? Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't even keeping track. Well, we certainly don't want to cut you off, but <laughs> that's the question. It has been, uh, it's now um, 20 to, to noon. So okay. it's, it's been about 25 minutes or so. Um, we, If you're comfortable, we can open up the floor to conversation now. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. conversation amongst each other or questions for Lisa. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa. That was, that was a wonderful introduction to the amazing work you've been doing. Um, both on a personal level and in, in the community. Um, I, I, I didn't realize Ivy was gonna be here, so this is fantastic. And thank you, Ivy, for showing up. Maybe um, Ivy should have the first <laughs> question uh, <laughs> as the two of you have been work, doing this work together, right? If, if you would like, or maybe, you know, just a comment, anything. Yeah, sure, thanks, uh, Keegan, for that invitation. Um, I don't know if I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> But I did want to say, um, Lisa, um, I've had the privilege of, you know, becoming, creating this sisterhood with you and like you're my best friend <laughs> and I could still like just sit and listen to you for hours and hours and days and days and you just really have so much wisdom and you really are just you really embody what it means to be a matriarch or what a matriarch is and so i'm just really honored to sit here and learn from you always um i don't have a question i just wanted to say thank you lisa for sharing like i <laughs> you just keep going that's what matriarchs <laughs> do we don't stop we don't have a time limit <laughs> I'm just, yeah, really honored to sit here today with my sister and I'm just, I'm so proud of you and you're, you're so incredibly inspiring. And yeah, thank you for everything that you do and everything you are. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I will just respond to that. Um, <laughs> the joke that came into my head was <laughs> because of like this whole colonial time and like I ended up making this joke and I was like, do you think a matriarch ever left a meeting early? <laughs> and so that's our joke within our program all the time because we always say it's going to be two hours. It's never two hours. <laughs> and so I'm just really honored to have collaborated and to have come together to create matriarch resistance and 
I love our vision together and I love our talks and I love where, where we both come from and how we will continue to teach each other as sisters and as indigenous women holding up our other sisters and our femme communities, you know, and what that looks like in our vision moving forward and really what decolonization means for us, you know, and I really honor the work that you're doing and just to be able to stand together in solidarity and figure this out, to figure this out, you know, like, and so, yeah, I'm just, I'm very humbled and I'm really honored to work with you. And I can't wait, follow Matriarch Resistance. <laughs> I'm done. Okay. So I'm, I'm also paying attention to the chat. If anyone is uh, more comfortable putting a question or a comment in the chat, please feel free. Uh, but until that time, I will also recognize our friend, uh, Laura Lee Wistasakut, who is actually the reason we know Lisa. So <laughs> thank you so much for showing up, Laura Lee. And if you haven't already uh, been to the exhibition of the legacy that Laura Lee has curated uh, along with her team, please go. I think it's on for another couple of weeks. But, um, oh, hi, Laura Lee. <laughs> hi, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for sharing. I really wanted to be here today. So um, I'm really happy that you've connected with Keegan and Leah. And yeah, just I'm really um, hopeful with you, um, you know, being one of our matriarchs. Um, I think it's really important that we have relationships like um, between the generations and so i'm also really proud of you and i'm happy that you're you have the space to, to talk about these really important things it's a heavy day so i've been you know kind of sad but uh you you really make me feel um hopeful for the future so thank you i'll comment I just want to say thank you so much. I remember when you reached out to me to be featured in the magazine. And that was my first time that any of my writing has that actually like the idea of writing came from that magazine. And I was so nervous. I was so nervous. And ever since then, we I have been able to reach out to you through my academics and just personally and I think again just really being able to come together collectively and to hear each other's stories and our purposes and the gifts that we share with one another and to be in a time where we can watch our sisters and matriarchs rise and only have an open heart and an open mind together and I'm just so grateful to have met you here in the Lekwungen territories and I can't wait to see to see the, what the future brings and if we can collaborate again. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that opportunity and it's led to where we are today. And so, cook down. Thanks. I just quickly wanted to say that I was the guest editor um, of that um, publication until, and that the Victoria Arts Council actually it was their thing, but I was just a guest. So, but I yeah. invited you. And because I saw your Facebook post earlier, I think that week, and you had said, I'm looking to um, write for publications. So, yeah. Anyways, that's all. But thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Keegan. Thank you so much, Lori Lee. Uh, I, Leah and I, we're in different venues so that there's no echo and we both just at the same time put in the link to the magazine that Lori Lee has guest edited for us that features Lisa's writing along with other uh, relationships to the land. Uh, so I see um, Andrea uh, has had uh, their hand up. So please, Andrea, uh, you can unmute if you like uh, and ask your question. Hi, Lisa. I'm sorry, I chimed in a little bit late. Um, but this is really timely for me because I'm giving a, we're calling it women, I'm in Washington, DC, and a colleague of mine and I are giving a women rule bus, bike tour around DC. One of our stops is the National Museum of the American Indian. And my question to you is, you know, we have some, some a few stories that we share. One is not indigenous, but it's a funny story about the, what happened on that land before. 
but I'm the one who usually makes some reference to the content of the museum and some of the stories. And my question to you is, do you have anything that you might recommend that I tell to a Washington DC audience of what to look for in this museum, what themes, what um, maybe a special exhibit that you're familiar with, or just any insight that you might provide me that gives a boost to the matriarchs who are represented in that museum? Um, so I just want to clarify, okay, so this is a museum and you're going to be speaking on, on behalf. Oh, I'm sorry. I was not terribly clear. No, it's a bike tour. Okay. And it is a, it's a women, we're calling it women rule. So it's a herstory tour. All of our stops and all of our stories are women's, are based on women's history. And I usually and one of our stops along the, our trajectory is the National Museum of the American Indian at the, which is Smithsonian. And I usually have something, it, I'm usually the one that speaks on the museum and what to see and what themes to look for. And I, I, I'm more familiar with the Woodlands tribes. So I usually make some reference to the Haudenosaunee and to the Shawnee, but my question to you is, is there something that you recommend that I read or that I say that is really timely? I will definitely bring up um, the, sto the story that's coming out of Canada right now, um, but might you okay. give me any suggestions on how to amplify what I offer? Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, I'm just wondering, is there like, because you mentioned that you have a relationship with the Haudenosaunee, mm -hmm. um, is there any way that you would be able to get like a local indigenous, um, even a woman or matriarch, if you're gonna talk on mm -hmm. that topic? Because I think it's so important is to do, um, a land acknowledgement, but not only that, but to have a speaker come in and and like speak on behalf of of what is being spoken about. And I think it's so important to have the voices of an indigenous woman speak on behalf of the land in which she is a part of. And so I think even just doing that work is really a part of being able to collectively as an ally to connect to Indigenous communities is going beyond and doing that work and connecting and bringing that guest uh -huh. in and really honoring um, the land in which um, this is being hosted on. And I think even with just allies, again, is just to be able to do that extra work of connecting and to like um and so that would be my advice personally is seeing if you want to speak on on um matriarch mm -hmm. is to be able to bring somebody in and like i don't know what that looks like but i think that's part of the work that that um that has to be done within mm -hmm. making these connections and that could turn into something so much more bigger and i think just um reaching out with a really good heart and um I always find like indigenous women um have so much knowledge and they have so much love in their heart and mm -hmm. it's, it's such a time of change as well and I think that is part of the change is to be able to hear from an indigenous perspective and if it is about matriarch through the eyes of a matriarch and the voice from which they are from and coming from Great, thank you. And thank you for the comment about the land acknowledgement. I will definitely incorporate that. Thank you. Great, thanks for showing up, Andrea. And it sounds like a, a very cool bike tour that you're part of. And it, it'd be amazing to, to see um, all kinds of women and, and femmes part of that tour, so. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a fun tour. It is yeah. a fun tour. <laughs> okay, uh, so we're about 10 minutes out from noon. We don't need to stay the whole 10 minutes. I, I do love this idea that uh, a 20 minute talk could last four hours. <laughs> like, 
not stop not stopping anyone from saying what they need to say. Um, but uh, if we haven't heard from someone that does, oh, I see Donna has their hand up. Hand up. So go ahead, Donna. Just make sure you're unmuted. Technology. Lisa, thank you so much for coming in and coming in unscripted and creating safety through vulnerability to speak about all of these things. That's not easy. And, you know, I'm not an Indigenous woman. I come from the Russian Dukabor people. And uh, we have a lot of honor through our ancestors and our grandmothers. And, you know, I, I have a story where I came home from university and I was out walking in, in an old little village and I came upon a woman that I knew of because her village was close to the college at Selkirk College, but I had never met her. And the first thing that she asked me, you know, here I am, you know, this girl coming home from university, walking around with her camera, she asked me who I was. She said, Chia, which in Russian is, who are you? And the only answer that would have been appropriate in that moment and I just said my lucky blessings that the words came out of my mouth without me thinking was my, do you know my grandmother and as soon as I could speak of who my grandmother was she knew who I was and it didn't matter who I was I was part of this lineage of, of people that she she knew and that I was part of her story and just the fact that she connected to my grandmother was an invitation that took me into her heart and into her home and it was like coming home on, on a level I've never experienced. So I want to tell you that there is no young woman on, on the earth right now that can't benefit from what you're doing with the work with matriarchy. It's so essential at this time. We've been in a, thank you. There are so many people that are going to benefit. And, you know, we've been in a period where we've been moving with this upward breath from, you know, A to B, and we need this matriarchal sort of axial energy to spread out where we can talk longer, where we can speak longer, where we can take our time to say what's important and to claim that time. So very courageous and thank you. And please continue with everything just the way it's coming to you in the way that you're doing. It's really, really good. <laughs> wow, thank you so much for sharing your story and I always love, I always love hearing other people's background and where they come from. And mm -hmm. I think even within that too is, again, like that's a part of what matriarch resistance is, is like, we always have a check-in circle and that's where we always go over time. And, you know, like even within that too, is like, we make sure that within each session and workshop that we're checking in with our sisters and femmes that we're saying, Hey, how are you today? Like, this is your space to be able to come, you know, because as indigenous women and femmes, like we don't have safe circles to talk about the like colonization or the intergenerational trauma, you know, like we are, we are living in a world where we walk into institutions and we're walking these streets where, you know, at one time, this is where our ancestors were. And then now it's been, you know, like exploited. It's been exploited for all the buildings and the roads. But at one time we were able to connect on a level where like our kinship is the land and the waters and the animals and we connected with our families in different ways and so to be able to create these safe spaces where these where these certain topics and issues can be talked about without expectation without a time limit without any of these barriers that that come in the way of really truly connecting with one another. And so, yeah, thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Just making sure, no oh yeah, Diana, I see your hand up. Please make sure you unmute. There, figured it out. Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know where to start. First of all, I want to thank you for being here today, Lisa, and everyone else. 
um, I'm heartbroken with what's happening in Canada and around the world. Um, my my connection to the First Nations community here in Canada was through marriage. I have an auntie through marriage, and uh, she was a wonderful part of it. Unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I don't know. I'm. I guess what I what I want to say is, the work that you're doing isn't just for the indigenous community; it's for everybody. That the healing that is going on is for everybody, because we're all connected, and we have so much to learn. Um, those of us that come from the colonizing country. I know I, I don't have those connections that you have with family. I don't have, um, I have some sense of my matriarchal lineage because I've done the research, but it's all on paper, it's not in person because I don't have those people around anymore. But I think that, you know, the main thing I wanted to say was the healing First of all, the recognition of what's going on and the open heartedness that you have is a benefit to everybody. And I just really want to honor you and honor the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you so much for. Um, sharing your vulnerability and your story. And um, I really, your comment about um, how the healing that I'm doing is not only for indigenous communities, um, I guess even within that too, like it kind of opened my mind as well that like of really being able to heal just humanity all in one. And um, I just want to say thank you. And yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Uh, well, thanks so much everyone for joining us for our first version of Creative Mornings under the Victoria Arts Council. What an amazing way to start off. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so grateful. And yeah, I can't wait to see what comes, what comes up for the future. Yeah, you know, this is going to be a monthly session, as people uh, might be aware. So uh, feel free to uh, sign on to our Creative Mornings homepage, and you'll get the um, announcements as they roll out. Um, the next, um, uh, the next session will be late July. We try to do them towards the end of the month so that we have enough time to let everyone know what's going to go on. <laughs> but if this is any indication of the kind of conversations to expect, I think it's a very good one. Um, I just want to um, say a couple of things about the Victoria Arts Council while I have your attention is that um, we have an exhibition on until the 27th, which is this Sunday, that's guest curated by Dylan Thomas, who's the Indigenous artist in residence for the city of Victoria. And this show is called When Two Waters Meet, and it actually explores Coast Salish um, traditions around salmon and water life and the um, and the recip re reciprocal um, tradition in, Jap in Japan. So uh, because Victoria and Morioka, Japan, uh, share a sister city or maybe a, a matriarchal <laughs> uh, recognition uh, towards one another. So you can come and learn more about that in the Arts Council or online at vicartscouncil.ca. And uh, we do have uh, a current uh, issue of Until Magazine that's live now, uh, and it's for uh, Pride. So it's being guest edited by David Geis, who's a filmmaker, and uh, that's full of uh, images and stories and essays all about queering the, the island in different ways. And finally, I'll say that uh, our next issue of Until Magazine, uh, the call for artists and contributors is July 30th, and that uh, topic will be uh, the theme is on disability. So the guest editor is Murray Sippel, uh, who is based on Salt Spring Island. And he's really interested uh, in artists that are pushing beyond their disability to challenge themselves, 
not only um, in their own studio practice, but even in society in different ways. So please, uh, you can again look at vicartscouncil.ca for all that information, and I'll just type it in the chat. <laughs> so that, uh, because it's always easier to see that. Anyway, thank you again, everyone who showed up. Uh, we're really honored uh, to be working with such strong women, and uh, in particular, as we recognize matriarchy this month. So thank you for the Indigenous perspective. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just also say, Lisa, if you could just let all the uh, listeners know how to learn more about Indigenous matriarchy, that would be great. You can follow on, um, we actually have a website link. It's through Ivy's Red Girl Rising and you can find it through programs. Um, also, we have a Facebook page. It's private just for um, confidential and safety of all of all the Indigenous women and femmes. Um, and then our Instagram is at Matriarch Resistance. And then also uh, what we're doing as well is um, um, Matriarch Resistance is a safe space for Indigenous women and femmes, but what we also have been um, including is door prizes. So our door prizes are created by Indigenous women and femmes that are crafting art pieces. And so that is our way of upholding the work being done outside of the program while also amplifying the talents and gifts of Indigenous women and femmes and supporting their businesses and um, their gifts and who they are. Great. I see Ivy has dropped in the actual link, not just me writing in all caps, red girl rising. <laughs> so thank you, Ivy. <laughs> um, okay, so please uh, follow those links while they're still alive. And um, as I mentioned, this has been recorded, so it'll be edited and uploaded to the website soon enough. So if you know you miss something, you can feel free. And also, of course, share the talk with your friends and your network. Uh, so we'll see you all next month. Thank you very much. Thank you. See ya. Have a good weekend. Bye, everybody.